What's good, everybody? It is Big Game James and my dog, DDP. And we're here with Positively Relentless EP3. And I may sound a little bit excited, but I ain't because <laughs> the Mavericks took a beat down, big dog. Uh, we was feeling good going in there, tied the series up. Me and you were talking back and forth on, on, on the text message, but Dallas took a loss. But, man, let's talk about that today. Let's get into it. We're going to talk about Mavs possibly jumping back in, tying this series, and we're also going to talk Cowboys football like we always do. Going to yep, just talk yep. about some things, free agency, maybe a little after draft, some CD Lamb. Is he going to really be that guy? Uh, but let's talk about it, DP, DDP, and let's per- first of all, let's talk about this game because that's that's going on and the Cowboys aren't let's talk about yeah. that big dog yeah that was painful uh, it'd be one thing if they had just gone to Phoenix and lost mm-hmm. they got trounced in the second half right. and I mean it, it's a tough thing to go to Phoenix in general the last couple of years I mean they won an NBA best 64 games this year so we know that they're a really good team we also know that they're like 53 and 0 win leading going into the fourth quarter. They don't give up fourth quarter leads. So it's almost like if you're going to get them to even have a shot, you're going to have to trip them up in those first three quarters. And for about a quarter and a half, Dallas actually came out firing. Like they started the game getting whatever they wanted, getting in the paint, getting buckets, good penetration and kick out buckets. I mean, man, if you get a big game out of Bertans, you got to actually capitalize on that. But the problem is, they got nothing out of the rest of the guys. Like Brunson got what he wanted. Luca got what he wanted. Nobody else got anything. No other starter scored. Like brutal, brutal uh, in that. Way too much ISO, way too much uh, back and down. I think Phoenix had really good adjustments and Dallas never really adjusted to those you know changes that Phoenix did. And that's not been a common thing for them. Like Dallas has been really good this year at making adjustments, particularly at halftime. So I was very surprised that as things started to kind of go off the rails and they gave up an eight point lead right before the half, they did take a, like, I think one point lead into the half. Mm -hmm. Um, But they, they kind of already started to have the wheels shake a little bit and they didn't make any adjustments. It's like they kept doing the same thing. And then the third quarter was another disaster, 12 turnovers in the quarter by itself. Um, and just completely stubborn, bad (laughs) offense, just brutal game was already over at that point, just painful. So they, they still got a chance. The home team has won every game, but the problem is if you're going to pull off the upset, you got to go win in Phoenix at some point, but first you got to handle your business on your home floor Thursday, I believe is the next game. So I don't know, man. Um, this is a good measuring stick series. The ultimate nature is Phoenix does just have more artillery at their disposal. Dallas is going to have to play above their heads and make phenomenal coaching adjustments. And you wonder how many bullets they got left in the chamber at this point. Yeah, I feel you with that, especially um, with the with the blowout in the second half. Uh, but the thing that, you know, you just ended with when you were talking about, um, you know, can Dallas bounce back at home? I think it could happen. But the problem is, just like you said, Every team, the, each team has won nothing but home games, mm-hmm. and you don't want to go into Phoenix if you haven't beat them all the series. Really think you're going to beat them in a game seven when it's going to be crazy in Phoenix? It, it's just that's just tough for me to not saying it can't happen. I'm not even trying to say I don't want it to happen. We want this to happen, but it's going to be very tough if you ever won a game yet and you just got blown out to beat them in Dallas and then for you to come on a game seven and right. then go ahead and beat them. That's going to be a very tough task, especially when you got guys like Spencer Dinwiddie going 0 for 3, 0 for 2, not not even, uh, I mean, even putting any kind of physical points on the board except free throws, and then Reggie Bullock going 0 for 5. And then mm-hmm. another alarming thing was Jalen Brunson and and Luca, eleven rebounds for Luca, seven rebounds for Jalen Brunson. Where was everybody else? You got the guards uh, in the backcourt that are your leading rebounders. We're mm-hmm. still missing that inside. We know about there's no inside presence, but still getting mashed up like that. And your other guards are your leading rebounders. That's a frustrating thing, you know. And it's like, where where do you think that 
it's going to actually come in a in a game seven when these guys, especially Dinwiddie, hasn't even showed up at all. It's just been frustrating, really, even to watch him play. But a guy that you was talking about, Doran Finley Smith, he's been turning up, even though he didn't have the greatest game this past game. You was talking about him to me. Man, talk to me about him because he's kind of been, you know, under the radar, but he's been quietly having a very good series. Well, Dorian Finney-Smith is definitely channeling his inner Michael Finley. <laughs> definitely, right. uh, definitely been, he's been breaking out the past couple of years, like as far as suddenly emerging as a three-point shooter. He had to completely rebuild his shot. I, I mean, his story is fairly well documented at this point, undrafted out of Florida, uh, basically a good player with like length and hustle, but not a lot else. Like he could defend a fair bit, but it was really trial by fire for him. And for the first three years of his career, it was just brutal three point shooting, like 28, 29%. Um, and that was like the high watermarks until he broke through with a 37%. Then he shot 39% last year. I think he was again, almost exactly the same, almost just a shade under 40% this year. So he's done tremendous work to rebuild his shot. He's probably Dallas's best modern like success story as far as like a homegrown talent in that respect. Mm-hmm. Um and in this playoffs and this playoff run in general, not this series specifically, he's been probably their most underrated guy. Like we we were talking before about, you know, yeah, he had a, a struggle game this past one as did all the starters not named Luca or Jalen. But in the games Dallas has won in this series, he has been the difference. It's not just game uh, game four, him knocking down eight threes on 12 attempts, including a stretch just over six minutes to play where he knocks, he gets a defensive stop, knocks down a three on the other end, strips DeAndre Ayton under the basket after he gets an offensive rebound, and then in transition hits a three going the other way. That's stop, three, strip, three in transition like that is the most phenomenal one two three four punch you can have that is a single right. dude putting the team on his back because the lead was four right. i think at the time right. he he provided the dagger and then he just kept jabbing him with the damn thing like he was just like uh-uh, we're done we're done here we're tying mm-hmm. the series mm-hmm. and uh that's that's a testament to to him and what he brings to it because it's not like he's just a three-point shooter for this team He's a guy who he's going to take the tougher defensive assignments. It may be not always the toughest in terms of like the, the dynamic nature of it. Like we mentioned Reggie Bullock struggles in game five. I think he might just be running out of gas at this point, honestly. Right. Like right. you think about how he's picking up like Chris Paul full court this series. He dealt with Mitchell last series. Like he's taking really difficult assignments and he had been shooting 40%, I think on the mm-hmm. postseason run. So he could be wearing down a little bit, which is understandable, but obviously spells trouble for Dallas. But Dorian in this run is shooting like 42 or 43% from three. Let me see. I got the stats here actually. So he's shooting 43%, I believe. Yeah. 43% from three on 7.2 attempts per game. That's really, really good. He's letting it fly. (laughs) And, and here's one of the differences too, as I mentioned, uh, Bullock in contrast, Bullock is he he'll move around more for his, like Dorian is a spot up shooter, mm-hmm. but Bullock, he'll come on a screen. He'll, you know, he'll move more with the ball. Dorian is literally just a spot up guy and Luca finds those guys. He sets them up. So it's a different variety, um, of approach there, but Dorian has absolutely been killing it in this, obviously 24 points in game four was huge. In the two games Dallas won, Dorian attempted 11 and 12 threes, respectively. So that's huge. You know how yeah. many he's shot in the games that they've lost? Talk it's to me, been, big dog. I think it's been four, three, and five. Mm. So about half, if not less, than what he's getting in those other games. Now, part of that is playing back at home. I get that. But right. he has been when he's getting looks and knocking them down. And we saw this the past two years, frankly, against the Clippers, especially last year, early in the Mm -hmm. series, Mm -hmm. when he's knocking down shots, Dallas is 
they're so much better. They're so much better, right? When he's really hitting them things, I didn't mean cut you off. But when we when we when when he's hitting those and hitting those corner threes, Mm -hmm. and it's in the flow of the game, Dallas is just like a different team. Just like you said, it's more they're more energetic. Um, you know, they're more lively. He brings that element to the team, and plus, I mean, he's leading the he's leading the team in free throw percentage as well. He's shooting ninety one percent from the uh, free throw line, so. Mm -hmm. That's critical as well. So you're dropping in 12 points, like five boards a game, almost averaging 40 minutes. Yes, he's definitely doing his thing. Kind of like the third person where you missed a hard away, things of that nature. He's come in yep. and really kind of saved the Mavericks uh, in this kind of series. Yeah, absolutely. And the thing with Dorian, too, like you, you just mentioned, like he's playing a ton of minutes and he's taking on like very difficult, if not the most difficult defensive assignment, like the second most uh, dif- difficult matchup. He's mm-hmm. also incredibly versatile and he's a guy who the best thing Dallas might have done this year. Like obviously everyone's going to point to the KP trade, but I, I think the under the radar thing that maybe they're seeing a little bit now and actually recognizing was giving Dorian on the same day, almost, almost within the hour they traded Porzingis they got Dorian to ink a new four-year $55 million extension. He was on a three-year $12 million contract before. Mm -hmm. To give some insight to that, his counterpart on Phoenix last year, uh, Bridges, signed a four-year $90 million contract. So uh, nothing, not taking anything away from Bridges. Fantastic defender has had some big impact moments in this series, particularly in Phoenix. Right. But... Do you think the difference between the two of them is $35 million? When you watch them play, it ain't, no. it ain't you don't know, seeing it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Bridges doesn't, you know, we've seen Dorian, we saw it last year against the Clippers early on, and we have seen it now in these two series this year. If Dorian is getting his looks and he's knocking them down, he is the difference in some of these games. It's like the fact that you have Dorian jumping in on the mix and pouring in 20 points, 24 points, whatever. That's when the other team is just like, shit, dude, we can't do anything with that. Like Luke is going to do what Luke is going to do, but you got mm-hmm. this guy pouring in that much work. Like we we're not able to like weather that storm. You don't really see that from bridges. Bridges is just kind of the utility guy who will chip in every now and then with that, at least in this series, that's how it's worked out. So it's phenomenal value for a guy and I'm telling you, man, if he had hit the market this summer, he would have gotten so much more. But mm-hmm. I think he actually has, the, as much as fans want loyalty from players to take like hometown discounts or whatever, I think Dorian actually legitimately did that to an extent. Like he still got a comfortable contract, but he understands like the, the Mavericks were really the only ones that took a shot on him coming out of Florida. He didn't get drafted. And they painstakingly developed him over the course of several years. And, you know, he's close with Luca and everything. So he's got a home here. Uh, It works out for him. So I think they got themselves a hell of a player. And I'm willing to say at this point, like I know we've talked before saying Brunson's kind of like the penultimate X factor here and like him proving his worth. He's still been good in this series for sure. He had a couple duds to start it off, but he's been pretty steady since then. I think Dorian is probably the the most significant um, or at the very least most underrated guy on this team right now. The guy who might have the biggest say in how far Dallas can ultimately go, because if he's going to be able to knock down those shots for them, then they're going to be more complete. You mentioned the corner three, especially Dallas loves the corner three. Mm -hmm. They are money in that corner and that's Dorian's shot. Even mm-hmm. even before his three point percentage started ticking up the past couple of years, that mm-hmm. was where he was most effective. Yep. Yep. So it's it's right there. But now he's getting now his chest is puffing out a little bit. He's taking right. trailer threes like you saw the dagger in uh, game four. Trailer right. threes behind the play and transition um, from Brunson like that is a deep elbow extended three, and he just no hesitation whatsoever. It's it's really. It's impressive, and I'm I'm glad they've locked him down for the foreseeable future because I think he is absolutely, if you want to talk about sports as a meritocracy, I think he's absolutely earned everything he's gotten and given them back more than they could have even anticipated. Well, just uh, flowing off what you just said, there's certain guys that just like, 
you know, um, loyalty in sports, you don't see a lot of it. Uh, but you do see those players. Like I said, he's not the big name guy. Uh, nobody really knew about him. The Mavericks mm-hmm. took their time, like you said, developed him. And he's smart. He said, hey, let me go ahead and lock that in. Um, if I go somewhere else, we know how to we know how the game is. So many times you see a player do good in a uh, franchise. Maybe that franchise develops them. They, they branch out and they go somewhere else. And then maybe you never hear about them again because it's not a good fit. Um, you know, people were looking at the outside, but you know, it's not always a good fit uh, when you go to another team. Right. Um, so maybe he looked at that and said, Hey, you're right. I got a home here. Everything is working out. So let me make it good. And then you just said the value that you're getting him for what you pay for the contract. I think the uh, thing with uh, bridges is he's more of a name guy and mm-hmm. that's why I probably got more of the money. Uh, but Hey, that's, that's more the Dallas's favor than anything else. Cause now, right now you're saying Doran Finney Smith is, is the glue right now. Mm-hmm. We know about Jalen Brunson. We know about Luca. We know what Brunson, Brunson has stepped his game up, has been a lifesaver in this series. Uh, well, in the playoffs in general, especially in Utah, he went nuts oh, yeah. uh, while uh, Luca, uh, Luca was out. But when you get a glue guy, you feel me? When you get a glue guy that's going to be able to be a utility guy, hit the threes when you need, free mm-hmm. throws, defend, give you quality minutes, uh, that's what's going to help you kind of propel you. And we hope that can happen um, in this next game six at home. We hope he has a big game. We're going to need yeah. that from him. And then hopefully he got to go turning crazy in a game seven. But a couple of players that you was talking to me about and we already know about, um, Luca and Devin Booker. Now them two been kind of going at it. They had a little serious little spat where they was uh, talk some trash back and forth. And even when I've been seeing in the interviews, DDP, I've been seeing little smirky things from like Devin Booker. Every time they mention Luca, he be smirking. Yeah. And so I'm like, this little might be. Is this a rivalry? You you talk to me about it. I said, is this a rivalry? It could be. And when you look at both them players, you told me you was going to tell me something about. Who would you really build around? Man, expound um, with me upon that uh, because that's something to talk about because them two is fiercely going back and forth with each other right now. No, for sure. And I I think the Booker stuff is intentional, completely intentional. Mm -hmm. I I think he's aware how insufferable he's being. Uh, Mm -hmm. He he literally (laughs) like laying on the ground. He got fouled uh, in the game last night drops to the ground like he got shot, lays there long enough that the officials huddle and decide, oh, you know, we will go ahead and review it. And then they end up getting a flagrant one called on Dorian Finney-Smith. Mm-hmm. And Booker literally looks up, sees what's happening, sees a fan right there recording him, smiles and says, the Luca special. Like, he knows what he's doing. Yep. It's also it's also kind of impressive to, first of all, look at the guys he's like trash talking or stepping to in this case. It's Luca and it's Jalen Brunson. He's not he's not saying shit to uh, Dorian or to Bullock, you know, the actual like known defenders on the team. Like he's trying to trash talk the guys that don't have that reputation and don't right. have that kind of that harder edge to them. But mm-hmm. You know, it, it is what it is. He He's fully aware of it, but at the same time, his trash talk comes uh, almost as an aside, not like to the guys, but, you know, that I, I think he's trying to get in their heads a little yeah. bit. And, you know, he, he saw it in game one, I think uh, him saying Jalen Brunson is too fucking small or whatever, like in, mm-hmm. in his face, essentially. And mm-hmm. then Brunson proceeded to run his ass over the next two games in Dallas, which was pretty amazing. Right. But I mean, you talk about it. He's a phenomenal scorer, no doubt. He's 25 years old. Like, it feels like he's been around for forever. A hundred years. years in. Yeah. You feel me? It's feel like he's been playing in the league forever. He's only 25. Yep. Seven years in the league. And, uh, you know, both are all NBA talents. And Booker actually finished, I think, a rank higher than Luka in the MVP voting this year, which is kind of funny to me. But here's the thing. It's like, who would you rather build around? And to me, like, yeah, you can look at their milestones head to head. Booker had an all rookie team honor, uh, one NBA player of the month distinction, six NBA player of the week distinctions. Obviously, he was a huge part of the team last year. They went to the finals and built a 2-0 lead. And, uh, you know, the big thing with Booker, though, is they never made the playoffs until the Chris Paul trade. Exactly. It, it's it's worse than that, though. And, I, and I'll get to that in a second. But let's just looking at Luca's distinction. So obviously the same all rookie team, uh, two all NBA first team honors, 
uh, two NBA player of the month distinctions, seven player of the week distinctions, five NBA rookie of the month distinctions, and obviously the rookie of the year award. It, it's like, those are just individual accolades. But if you set those aside, who put the team on their back and who led them somewhere? Luca in year two got the Mavericks into the playoffs and they've been in the playoffs three of his four years overall. So they went from complete lottery team. You know, I, I love Dirk and it was great seeing him play that last year, but that team was never going to have any chance at the playoffs with Dirk playing 15 minutes. It was a farewell tour just to bridge the gap between Dirk to Luca. Like that's, that's just what it was. That team was not going to go anywhere. So like, that's the reality of what that team was. But other than that, Luca has always had the Mavericks no worse than the seven seed. And he being the underdog in several matchups took the Clippers in two years, they were considered contenders to six and then seven games. Then this year beat the jazz, even though the jazz were the lower seed, they were still picked by most experts to beat Dallas in the first round. And now he's taken the 64 win Suns to at the very least six games. Like, He's balling out. We've talked about his playoff scoring averages, how like the obscene records and milestones he's setting. Meanwhile, you have Phoenix with Devin Booker. And until Chris Paul got there before last year, this is just to give context to how bad it is. First of all, you you had to add a generational talent uh, who's literally called the point God so it's like, oh, wh- which guy needed more help? Like the help Luca got was KP, who, you know, never uh, panned out, never really got to translate to anything. Luca elevated Dorian Finney Smith guys, Maxi Kleba, Jalen Brunson. Like he helped elevate that team into a four seed and a five seed last year. That's what he was able to do. But for Kmart Kobe, <laughs> you're talking about a guy who before Chris Paul got there, he lost 59% of his games before Chris Paul got there. You're talking about a guy who, let me see. So, sorry, let me correct that. I actually was not near harsh enough. He's lost 59% of his career games to date. And before Chris Paul, he lost 81% of the games he played in. Sorry, the the kids are cooking. (laughs) All right, no worries. (laughs) But did you, did you hear that stat, though? Yep, I sure did. 81% of the games he played in prior to Chris Paul getting there, he lost. 81%, 81%. 81%, bro. Yeah, and like, now he hella cocky right now, too. Oh, the, yeah. This, he, he's so cocky right now. Like the Smurfs, like I said, you know, I've just been kind of frustrated with them Smurfs because, uh, you know, we remember. We remember Booker. We remember how you when nobody was talking about Phoenix. We remember how y'all was lost in purgatory. We remember how many coaches y'all was going through mm-hmm. uh, year in and year out. We remember the controversy that was going on in Phoenix. We remember all those things things how quick he quickly he has forgotten and just like you said um ddp just kind of maybe flowing off of you um nobody knew i mean we knew about devin booker but he was grabbing he was getting 22 24 26 game and you weren't winning anything you got luca who's 26 8 and 8 dang near in his career and like you said he has put the team on his back let's let's keep it real you lose kp right Mm-hmm. Everybody thought Dallas would probably just fall straight off because yeah. now they don't have their big man guy. And now Dallas is going to fall off. Dallas gets better. You know what I'm saying? They that's that's to me, Luca taking it to another level because he knows KP is out and he knows who else is around him. But nobody's thinking with Dorian Dorian Finney Smith, Jalen Brunson, mm-hmm. Max Maxi Cleaver that the Dallas Mavericks were going to be a four seed and still be playing right now. Let's keep it real. And if you're building a team around, I'm not building a team around a shooting guard. When right. I got a point guard that can do everything, you understand what I'm saying? He can rebound, he can pass, he can score, he can hit the three. And as I said before, he can control the game more than uh, Devin Booker can. And I want a guy that can really control the game more than yeah. a Booker can because he's a two guard. And my guy's a point guard with the same size and probably mm-hmm. a little bit bigger. So. Yeah. Yeah, when I really look back at that, to me, um, I love Booker's talent. I when I came out of media school, uh, DDP, I actually did an article on Booker 
And that was in 2016. And I was talking about him then that mm-hmm. watch out for this kid. He's going to be one of the next kind of top scorers or one of the greats. So it's not, I've always felt Devin Booker and liked him as a player. Uh, but if we're talking about building a team around, to me, that's a no brainer because I like to have a guy who's controlling the tempo and it could get me everything rebounds, points, assist, and uh, really can kind of control the team. I like that. And you see the trajectory and what he's did so far. I think there was a stat comparing him with um, LeBron James on like triple doubles. I yeah. think uh, his trip, LeBron had like 10 up until this point. Mm-hmm. Luca already got like 46. And bro, we already know what King James has done and with, with the phenomenon when he came into the league, bro. He the the triple doubles comparison is is just crazy in that short period of time, big dog. Yeah, I mean Luca Luca controls all aspects of the game, and he had a bad game uh, the other night. And I know some people are going to say like, "Oh, well, I would love to have a bad game in which I still had twenty eight eight And we're talking about decision making. We're talking about controlling the game. I, I think he got thrown out of his element, and he didn't adjust. And he was making he wasn't handling possessions well. He wasn't leading the team. Uh, in the way they needed, whether you're, whether you're talking about body language or just how he was controlling possession after possession, uh, just dribbling the ball into the dirt until there was five seconds left and then either forcing a shot or throwing a hand grenade to someone with one second to shoot. Like that's mm-hmm. not, that's not ideal. Mm-hmm. But even, even back to that, like if, if we want to talk about like Devin Booker, um, you know, being kind of soft essentially. And I think he is, I think he's pretty uh, charm and soft. Phoenix as a team acts like a team that's won multiple championships already. Like they have a weird kind of arrogance about them. They threw a fucking parade for making the finals last year. Who does that? Phoenix fans, they weird out there. Trust me, my homeboy. <laughs> but, but the lives team out had there. to be part of it. That's <laughs> what I'm saying. They threw the parade. They right. Like you would think a veteran like Chris Paul would not participate in something like that. Like, nah, man, I go into the finals. Cool. But I'm trying to win it. Like, I'm glad they blew the two, two Oh lead. Like that, that's the weakest thing I've ever seen. And it's weird to me too. Like people who want to, you know, throw dirt at Luca, they'll point to like, Oh, well, what about playoff success? He's playing in his fourth series at this point. Yeah. He lost to a favorite twice when he was the underdog. And then, he got a win this year and now he's going up against the best team in the playoffs. Like, and he's been individually sensational. Mm -hmm. So what's, what's your point? And if you're trying to use that point in contrast to say like Devin Booker, like, Oh, what about playoff wins and finals appearances? The fuck did Devin Booker do before last year? Exactly. Did did he get to the playoffs? Nothing Mm -hmm. like his first three years in the league were like 24 wins, 23 wins, 21 wins. Then, Hey, they broke out 31 wins. And then Chris Paul got there. And suddenly it's like, oh, okay, now things are fine. Like, it, it's frustrating. Like, there, there was a little more time in there, obviously. But uh, it's, it's frustrating because it's like, wait, so they had one run in which it was more about the guy they added than about him. Like, he's the leading scorer. He's the number one option. I get it. But, like, if you look at Phoenix, I say what makes Phoenix the best team is not Devin Booker. I think it's Chris Paul. There's a reason the two games in Dallas when they took Chris Paul completely out, made him turn it over uh, five and seven times and even got him to foul out in short order in game four. There's a reason Dallas won those games pretty handily. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's because he's the engine. He's what makes that team work. Now, head to head. Yes. Since Luca came into the league, Luca and Deandre Ayton, uh, Phoenix has crushed Dallas and Booker has had some big scoring games. I, I don't dispute that at all. It's uh it's one of those things where they've, even when they weren't good, they had a pretty good collection of long lanky defenders and guys who could kind of be scrappy and utility type players. And uh, that matched up better with Dallas than they had really enough to counteract with. So I look at their team now and it's like, look how many lottery picks they have on there. Look at the, the names at this point they have on there and the significance of those names. And then compare that to the Dallas roster where you got Maxi and Dorian who are both undrafted where, um, you know, like some of these guys too, like Dinwiddie, he's a guy that people thought was washed two or three years ago. And to be fair, he's kind of, 
he's doing even worse in this series than he did in the Jazz series. At least he had 15 points per game inefficiently against the Jazz. He's mm-hmm. now like seven points a game, and he's turning the ball over three times a game, which was a complete reversal from the regular season with Dallas. But right. it's uh, it's striking how this team is, from a talent perspective, they're completely outclassed. Even though, even though I think they have the best player in the series, even though I think Brunson has still rounded out and to be a pretty good player for them again after the first couple of games were a, a kind of wake up call to him. I still just think Phoenix has way more firepower. And even though Dallas has good coaching, I think Phoenix has really good coaching too. So I, I just think the complete assessment is Dallas either has to play out of its mind, particularly its role players like Dorian Finney Smith, like Bertans, like Maxi. You got to get three or whatever of those guys, two or three of them at least stepping up every game, plus Luca and Jalen doing their thing. Or you're going to have a night like the other night where Luca goes for 28, Jalen goes for 21, and your next leading scorer is Bertans with 10 off the bench. Dorian had eight. Dorian was the only other starter to score. Nothing from Bullock, nothing from Powell. Uh, Dinwiddie, like I said, 0 of 3, three turnovers in 16 minutes. Like, it's it's rough. If Dallas is going to do anything, it's going to be because they actually have their guys show up. But as far as, like, who I'm building around, who's done more with less and who's achieved more individual accolades? Because the the high watermark for Booker people point to is the 70 point game. They won like 21 games that year. And you that 70 to... point game that they were getting blown out in that yes. game. And it was, and that's not, that's wanna, not something to brag about. You want to talk garbage time and pat, stat padding. That's that it. Was it. That that's game was definitely it. it. If you watched that game, cause I watched that games. Um, I saw it was stat padding because it came to the point where the team saw he was going to get that number and they were pushing him to get it. You're getting smashed in that game, by the way, yep. you got smashed in that game. And they were just kind of, it was kind of like, they were like worried about the individual accolade more than the win. That's how bad it had got there that they weren't even concerned about the win. They were looking at the point. So that's how quick, Lee, we forget, you know, how um, it's changed. But I think another thing with it is, you know, is not just with Booker, I think the thing maybe kind of going around the league now, um, you know, people probably get on Luca um, with him saying a lot after, the, you know, if he goes to the hole, asking for a call a lot. I've been hearing a lot about that in the streets. Booker, too. Um, <laughs> Booker does it, too. Uh, but I think I, I'm, I'm going to just keep it real, dog. Uh, this dude is a white boy um, from um, uh, from Europe. And people don't want to keep hearing that. That's mm-hmm. just what it is. They they they're not used to that. Uh, a, a player that's coming in like Luca, dominating the way he is, and they're not used to uh, a European, maybe white 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 guy just talking like that. Besides the Larry Bird, but he wasn't from European. And I think NBA American players still kind of feel some kind of way about that. I think I feel, and that's from me, my sure. opinion, because I see how they play against them. And I see this, see how, how the, the stuff is coming now. So I'm like, mm, that's what I kind of think it is more than anything else. And the fact that he's kind of killing everybody and, you know, everybody's like, look at this and look at that. I think NBA players are tired of hearing about Luca, and now now he's starting to get that like maybe backlash kind of hate. And I see it in this series, and I see it with Chris Paul, and I see it with Devin Booker, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to that. As far as the the European thing, the last four MVPs have been European players, and the now two time reigning MVP is Jokic. So obviously, like it, it's not a it's not a talent discrepancy thing like it was perceived before. But Mm -hmm. I I do definitely think that because of Luca's just laundry list of accolades, even before he came to the NBA and his young, I mean, his age coming in, like he was being basically branded as a prodigy coming in. And to be fair, he is. I mean, what he did back then was crazy. Yeah. I mean, multiple championships and MVPs by like 18, like absurd. Um, But at this point, now it's like, okay, now it's the highest level. He still has to grow and learn. That's why it's like, you can say like, yeah, he had 28 and 10 or whatever last night. And that's great. But you know, it, you have to actually hold these guys to the highest standard. It's like, if a lot is, if you're given a lot, then a lot is expected of you. And that's kind of the case with Luca here. So you can say like, oh, well, his bad game was still like a, a very productive one from a stat sheet perspective. 
Yeah, but his usage rate is like 45%. His usage rate is way up there. Like a, a complimentary or competitive, comparative, there you go. Um, usage rate would be like Russell Westbrook's MVP season. Now, Russell was a much older player, respectively. He was late 20s when he was doing that. But that's that's a concern for me, and that's why I think Dallas needs to build around him so they don't have to ask that much of him. But when you got the ball that much in your hands, you're going to be able to fill a stat sheet. You should be able to. I mean, shit, he can go one of 10 from three in game four and not really matter <laughs> because – the rest of his stat sheet still looked good. And thankfully the rest of the team still shot the ball well from three. It's like, if you take his three point shooting out of the equation, Dallas shot the lights out in game four from, from three, it, but he was one of 10. So it dragged it down, but yeah, man, he's, he's a phenomenal talent. The, the debate between him and Booker, it's, it's silly. It feels kind of like splitting hairs because they have some similarities, right? Like we, we just talked about, they both want the foul call. They'll both call for the foul call, extenuate, uh, extenuate contact and all of that. Booker will straight up flop and lay on the ground. Like he's been shot and then smile and wink at the camera. Like it's, it's that kind of thing that rubs people the wrong way. But I do think as people look at that, if they don't have a dog in the fight, they see that and then they have the extra little ammunition against Luca. They're pointing his way to your point because he's the European player doing that. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Booker, it's like, ah, well, you know, like Chris Paul does Chris Paul flops and no one talks about it. She's like, Oh, it's what he does smart veteran. Luca right. does it. And it's like, it's not a veteran move from a young player. It's right. flopping. It's weak. It's mm -hmm. soft. It's mm -hmm. whatever. And then they get mad when he hits a step back three and mean mugs them on the way down the right. court. It's just like, dude unless you're like dirk and you almost have almost no emotion other than like maybe a yell once in a while you're going to face that kind of reaction like that's just the case you still have people who don't really pay attention to the game like fans on twitter and stuff who don't think luca's that special and think he's mostly a product of hype and it's just like dude if you think that in year I'm four tired of hearing it man it's absurd I'm it's tired of hearing it. I'm tired of hearing the DDP. It's like I had a I had this one uh, dude come in my tweet when I was saying, "Look at Booker getting a little spicy. We need to calm him down." He's like, "Ah, oh, he's better than that overrated white boy." I'm like, "Bruh, yeah. like I I don't even like if somebody send me a tweet like that, I don't even respond to something right. like that because obviously you don't know anything about basketball nor the game. So me and you can never have an intellectual sports or basketball conversation when you say Luca is weak. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm done with you guys. Uh, so it is what it is, big dog. Um, so uh, yeah. let's kind of let's let's. Well, to answer that, uh, if I if I got to build around a, a single player and I'm yep. trying to make my team as good as I can in the long run. I'm going to take the guy who has proven he did the most by himself that didn't With have to least. bring in another generational <laughs> talent right. just to make the damn playoffs. Now, uh, granted, old they went generational further. talent. Yes. But still a guy who at 37 now is playing great. Chris Paul is for so, sure. Like LeBron right. got a lot of love for that throughout the year. At age 37, what he's doing phenomenal. Yes. Mm -hmm, Chris mm -hmm. Paul needs some of that love too. He's not getting enough sure. of it. I don't think. Yeah. He's playing a young man's game. Yep. Well, you know what? We've been talking about the Mavs, dog, but it's time to talk about them Cowboys. How about them Cowboys? Yep. It's time for a, a new segment here. Still kind of ironing out the wrinkles, but we're going to go a little bit of rapid fire talking different different Cowboy topics here. I know mm -hmm. I know you had some thoughts of things you wanted to, to really tackle here, so I'll let you take points on that. But yeah, this is going to be kind of six quick uh, rapid fire things where it's quick thought uh, with it, kind of your gut feeling with uh, these different things, whether it relates to free agency, who's under more pressure, what we think of CD Lamb's upcoming season and how he'll step forward, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So do you want to do you want to take point on that, I guess, or do you want me to issue you the prompt and then you kind of jump in from there? You just throw it at me, big dog, and I'm right. gonna just I'm gonna just spit it at you. Like right. bam, I'm gonna six shoot you like for real for real. <laughs> Crinkle up some paper and throw it at the camera. No, <laughs> I'd probably knock the camera over accidentally or something. Um, all right. So 
first of all, we've seen the Cowboys have been kind of, uh, shall we say, passive or quiet in free agency so far. But uh, do you think they will be more active now in this kind of third wave of free agency now that the draft has come and gone and they have a better idea of what they still need? Um, I'm going to say they may be a little more active because this is the time that they always do. If you look at the Cowboy, Stephen Jones, this, he always likes to wait to that third level. Why? Because it's cheap. The mm-hmm. longer he waits, the cheaper those players get. So that's why he tries to wait them out. So I think maybe a player I've been mentioning, Anthony Barr, could be a person of interest. I think the Cowboys are keeping their minds open because they have, I think, like 13 to 15 million still open. But to say that they're going to guaranteedly jump in there and get somebody, no, I'm not even saying that. I'm going to say it's like 70, 30 that Mm -hmm. they're not going to do something. Mm. But I'm going to give them 30% that they might slide in somebody because Stephen Jones is like to hold on to that money, big dog. Yeah, that's pretty bad if you're going to hold on to 15 million. Uh, (laughs) I I definitely agree that if he's going to do anything, it's going to be bargain bin shopping at this point. But, you know, if you look at what their haul was in free agency last year, they actually did find some quality guys. They found several Mm -hmm. players that worked out way better than we anticipated. Now, to be fair, the several years before that, they tried the same strategy, crashed and burned every time. Right. Remarkably. And uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. I'm slightly encouraged only because it's like okay maybe they tweaked their process and their evaluation a little bit maybe their coaching staff is better now and can better assess what they need maybe it was more of a fluke that the 2020 free agency class was a dumpster fire for them right maybe but overwhelming history considered it does kind of feel like yeah it kind of feels like everything hit right for you last year and you still screwed that up in the end so I think they might make a couple moves. I think it's going to be, I mean, if they got bar, I'd be thrilled with that, but right. I, I don't know what they'll do. I'm, I'm kind of thinking it'll be names that you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. That, that's a nice mm-hmm. player, but mm-hmm. it's going to be someone that if they come in, they're going to have to play like above their head, which was the case with their guys last year, guys that mm-hmm. you were like, Oh, that's a nice pickup or oh, that's encouraging. And then they have a great season. And suddenly you're like, Ooh, they need to try and hang on to this guy. Exactly. It, it would be something like that, I think, but yeah. yeah. It- so let's uh, let's talk about pressure a little bit. Who's under more pressure this year, Dak or Kellen Moore? Gun to your head. Oh, man, that's that's kind of tough because we talked about this last night on the final word. Shout out to those guys out there. Um, it was real. It's real tough. Um, you know, I've been thinking about that back and forth, and I'm going to say Dak Prescott and by a little bit um, because Kellen Moore is so protected. And, and that's the reason why. When I listen to Stephen Jones, once again, when he said, I love Kellen Moore, so we are bringing him back. And even when this uh, series ended the way it did, I didn't hear people going, especially from the front office, going off on Kellen Moore. It's almost like they're giving him a pass because it wants to validate why we kept him. So that's why you're not going to hear that noise about him because it's the Joneses that kept Kellen Moore because he was their boy wonder. So, of course, he's not going to get any of that. But Dak Prescott, I feel like, still has the most pressure for the simple fact that now you don't have Amari Cooper. A mm-hmm. lot of people said yet you hung on Amari Cooper. That's who made you better. So mm-hmm. now you don't have Amari Cooper. You don't have those weapons that you did last year so now it's got what they're going to people are going to be like and he's never been a quote-unquote huge fan favorite a lot of people love Dak Prescott but a lot of people don't love Dak Prescott in the Dallas Cowboys so a lot of people are already undermining him from day one so to me he still has the most pressure especially after that 12 and 5 season especially how they lost in the playoffs so the eye is really going to be on and they're going to say you're the franchise quarterback we want to see what's what what it is so i think it's still pressure on him uh more than keller moore because he's not protected like him that's interesting my my initial thought before hearing your answer uh was i would have thought more because it's easier like i know the joneses like to pick their handpick their guy right it was jason garrett before that and they held on forever to to that ridiculous experiment but it's like they do handpick their guy and they want to hang on to it but it is an offensive coordinator and it is a guy who okay like we had a number one receiver we weren't getting the production out of him that we wanted which has to reflect on some level on the system and now we basically picked you over him 
And so there's going to be more pressure now to still produce. But after, after hearing you kind of mention that, it's like, well, they, yeah, they did essentially pick and shield Kellen Moore because Amari Cooper was incredibly outspoken about Kellen Moore's system and how they weren't feeding him enough and that he needed more targets. Like that's incredibly valid. So there's a lot of pressure on, on Kellen Moore. Yeah. But it's outside pressure. That's the thing. There's nothing in house unless Dak does something or says something, but Dak and him are tight. They've, they've been tight. There's a reason he, before he was OC was the quarterback coach and, uh, you know, Dak backed him up initially his rookie year before Moore broke his leg in training camp or whatever, mini camp, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, he actually is very insulated where it matters. Whereas Dak, he does have to prove something. And weirdly, he, even though he got paid the way his contract is kind of set up, it's like, he essentially has to prove that he is one of those top, top tier franchise guys mm -hmm. now or, I mean, you want to talk about backlash to some extent from the fans. Talk about if they move on from Dak Prescott and what your mm -hmm. quarterback prospects look like, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like as far as the decision makers are concerned, just from the actions they've taken and the things they've said, I could absolutely see a scenario where Dak is under more pressure where it counts, not externally, but internally. And it's mm -hmm. the polar opposite of the Kellen Moore situation. So that's, mm -hmm. that's interesting. You said that. And then I started thinking like a different angle and I was like, damn, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's, we're talking pressure. How about uh, mm -hmm. Mike McCarthy? Lame duck. <clears throat> lame we know duck he's lame. We know he's yeah. lame. Is he a lame duck though? <laughs> Yeah, he's a lame quack quack to me, dog. And, uh, you know, I don't even want to think that. But what leads me to think that uh, when you got Sean Payton waiting in the wings, mm -hmm. he just mysteriously retires and I'm just going to take a year off and just think about stuff. And you hear Jerry Jones glowingly talking about this dude like Jerry Jones. It, it, that's what he does. Uh, what makes me think that after this se this past season, the 12 and 5, and you had the, everything at your disposal, the best time to win it and you did an absolute dud that I'm thinking you're going to come back with Sean Payton sitting there mm -hmm. staring you in the face that you're going to come back and have this miraculous season. You're going to miraculous with a lesser season. team. You feel me with a lesser team with all this controversy that's been going on in Dallas. You're going to miraculously rise above all this and take the Dallas Cowboys to a NFL championship. I'm sorry. I don't believe it. I think this is lame duck. And I don't care even if it is that one of the easiest schedules in the N NF the NFL yep. Dallas, I feel is still going to take a step back. And um, I just feel like, you know, you got the pressure to get to a NFC championship or a Super Bowl, or you're not going to be here. So I, I'm sorry, your best opportunity was last year with more. Now you're going to do more with less. I don't see it. And I feel like he's a lame duck. He's absolutely, right. yeah, absolutely a lame duck. Not even a question. The fact that even as the team was winning last year, people were freaking out about losing the coordinator saying like, well, you got to promote one of them to head coach. You can't have McCarthy in here. You, you can't lose both of them. You got to either promote more early in the year. If people said that, or you got to promote Dan Quinn. Like you can't, you can't lose them. He, he was already, even when the team was winning, a lame duck. Like, mm -hmm. people were saying, like, short of a Super Bowl. Right. You, you have he to He had that pressure from as soon as he signed the dotted line. He was yeah. like, this is what it is, bro. You either do this or you're gone. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's not even a question to me. I, I think he's, this is going to be the last year. We, we saw the tension in the clash as the Sean Payton drama dragged on and how long it took for the Cowboys to kind of, like, uh, okay, nothing's happening right now. Like Mike's our guy. Like, yeah. And Mike went on that podcast and kind of talked about it. And it, I, I think he's rubbed wrong by it as well, but it's, there's just no way it's not a healthy working relationship at this point. And frankly, it's like, well, you're an offensive minded guy, but then they handpicked Kellen Moore to be the dude for that. And so it's his system. He's calling the plays like you have a role in the culture, but like, what is it that you're doing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. what, what makes you irreplaceable? Even if you improve the culture of the team compared to previous years with Jason Garrett, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're irreplaceable, especially with all the other stuff we've talked about with the guys that do have a bigger impact on the, the X's and O's and the outcome. So yeah, lame duck for sure. 
Let's talk CD lamb, Sedarian mm-hmm. lamb. Let's, let's talk about it. So he's, he's in an interesting situation here. The unquestioned number one receiver now on this team. Let's uh, let's project his upcoming season. Is he that dude? So I'm going I'm to break this one in two. All right. Let's just first project the stats and then we'll talk about the NFC East and his place in that as a receiver. Uh, what do you anticipate for CD lambs season? Um, I think he's going to go kind of crazy this year. I think this is year three. Mm-hmm. He's the guy now. Uh, Michael Gallup is going to be out probably the first, what, five games. I'm going to say at least five first five mm-hmm. games of this uh, season. you got a rookie coming in and Jalen Tolbert. Um, you know, Dalton Schultz is going to be on the one-year deal. So he's going to get those targets. I mean, he's been getting the targets. He was the, uh, one of the most targeted guys on the team last year, even with Amari Cooper. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is that year three. I think the Cowboys will play him later on like they always do when they want to not pay you. Uh, but this is the third year. So that third year, explosive, 88. We want to hear all the noise. They want to get all the hoopla back in Dallas. So they want that excitement. So, yeah, I think those numbers are going to be good. So 79, 74, 79 catches the first year. I'm going to say he might get about close to 90 catches this year and maybe about 1,300 yards. And I'm going to say he's going to be the first guy, I think, in Dak Prescott's career to have double-digit touchdowns as a receiver. That's an interesting footnote, too. Uh, Yeah, so he had 79 catches for 1,100 yards. Uh, and six touchdowns last year as a rookie, obviously had the single season rookie receiving record with 935. He had 120 targets compared to 104 for Amari Cooper last year. Now, Cooper did play one game less, but he, he it's not like he was going to get 16 targets in that game, even if he right. was playing. So right. he was more targeted than Cooper was. He's a, he's a good route runner, but he's not always as crisp as he should be communication has also seemed to be a little bit of an issue with him and Dak at times. They're not always on the same page and uh, the drops, man, like that's, that's so weird to me, even still like through his first couple seasons, that's been a much, that wasn't an issue at all at Oklahoma. I don't remember ever seeing him drop a ball at OU and that's been a consistent issue with him. So here's, here's what I think. I think he is going to have a career best year, but I think it's going to be more, it's going to be similar production wise, still more, but similar to this past season. So we had 1100 this past season. I think he'll go for 1200 some odd pushing 1300. Kind of like you said, uh, his catch rate last season was like 66%. I think he'll be pretty in tune with that. I think the big thing for him is you're going to see more of the explosive plays, more of the, you know, maneuvering in open field, kind of like you saw at OU And I think he's going to cut down a bit on the drops and all told that's going to give the illusion of a big breakout year for him. Not to say like illusion as in like, it's not real. It's not actually happening, Right. but it's, it's going to give this greater perception to like, Oh, he's totally broken out on his own when it's like, no, it's more a natural progression of kind of what he's doing. And like you said, moving into that number one spot. Now he's going to get more opportunity. Conversely, He's also going to draw the top cornerbacks and he's going to have entire game plans built around him. He could hide a little bit before now, not so much. So I'm curious to see how he responds to that, but I do think he's going to have uh, a career best year. Yeah. I I think that I feel you on that last part. Uh, We're going to be curious to see how he reacts to being the guy now Mm -hmm. and defense is going to be basically centered around you and stopping you. So we're going to see that because you had the benefit of Amari Cooper and even Michael Gallup, you still had the benefit of that. Now you can't not, we're saying that he's hiding, but there's no way to hide. It's all going to be you. So let's see what really happens. Yep. So staying on that beat is CD lamb, the best receiver in the NFC East. Ooh, we, that's Eagles tough, have, bro. Eagles have made some interesting moves that have kind of muddied that a little bit. Muddied that a little bit. A.J. Brown's just come over in the fold, and then you still got Stagary Terry, Terry McLaurin. I think he's a yep. legit guy over there in D.C. Is he the best receiver in the NFC East right now? I'm not going to say yes. I'm going to say he's close. I'm going to say mm-hmm. he's real close. But, um, you know, when I look at uh, Terry McLaurin, what he's done, especially with nobody, he ain't yeah. really had no quarterback over there at all. The problem and is he's, he's had too many. <laughs> you feel what I'm saying? And he still put up some pretty good numbers mm-hmm. uh, with no kind of quarterbacking over there. Um, and, and I know what CD did with Dak being out, uh, but t- Scary Terry, and I think he has more of the speed too um, than the, uh, the 
CD Lamb, and I'm just gonna take him, and I'm and I'm gonna take CD Lamb over AJ Brown. I'm gonna keep it real. I know what AJ Brown's done over there with Tennessee. I still feel like CD Lamb is better than him. He might he might not be as big as him and physical as him, but I feel like still he's still a better receiver. And we need to see what AJ Brown's gonna do with some Jalen Hurts. That's what we're gonna talk yeah. kind of see what kind of receiver you really are now that you're. And I ain't even think Tannehill was that great. You know what I'm saying? But mm-hmm. we we gonna see. Uh, but I'm gonna give Terry McLaurin just a little bit, please, Cowboy fans. Don't don't shoot me. Don't beat me up. Don't don't. Oh man, big game. Don't know what you're talking about. I'm sorry. Just a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna take Scary Terry right now. The quarterback has been lacking over there in Washington, and he's still been putting up some really good numbers. Um, uh, so you know we'll see. And I, and now he's got a course and wins over there. You know we'll kind of see. But I'm gonna just take him, but a smidge DDP, a mm. smidge over over CD Lamb right now. Fair enough. Uh, so kind of vibing off of what you were just saying there, if we're talking about measurables, then yes, I'm right there with you. I think in this context, it matters more about their situation. And like you mentioned quarterback, obviously, in, in the case of Hertz, like the overall situation that allows them to thrive, who is going to produce the most because of their situation. Some of these guys are close enough of a toss up that their differing situations can create a situation where their production might far exceed uh, some of the other guys, or at least, you know, make, make a bigger impact in that sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at it that way. And I say, I do think he probably is until proven otherwise. And it's because I think he's going to have a career best year. And I think he's, as I said earlier, he's going to have some more of those explosive plays that we've seen glimpses of them at times, not just the juggling catches, like the, the one that gets played all the time at Minnesota, the falling backwards thing. Uh, I think you're going to see more big plays like his walk off in new England, where he's, you know, just taking the top off the defense or he's weaving through traffic and making things happen. And that's going to, that's really a just continued progression for him because it's something that in college by his last year at Oklahoma, I mean, shit, he got the ball and like every play was game breaking. Like it was, it was like a prime Deshaun Jackson, where it was just like, anytime he touched the ball, you were just almost like holding your breath. And you, you know, that firsthand from the, yeah, the Texas game. I've seen enough of uh, it. You feel me? <laughs> Yeah, so did the five Longhorns he went right through. But, uh, yeah, so I, I think you're going to see a little bit more of that. And, you know, perception is everything when you're having that kind of debate. So if he's able to put some of those plays together with somewhat similar stats, a little bit better even than what he's been doing previously, then I think that's going to kind of kind of build that perception even further where people are going to say, like, yeah, no, that's the guy. And even, right. if, it, even if it's not just the measurables – the the system the team the quarterback all that allows him to be that guy and be that better than the other guy is able to be his best self so yeah that's uh that's my take on that so let's move in now to the sixth option this is actually the one i added into the mix here so this is all new to you you don't know where i'm going uh-oh, with this uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. i got you i got you over here but i'm yeah, not smacking like, with this mm, hand no yeah i'm, I'm looking like uh-uh. <laughs> uh all right so Let's uh let's do a quick stock report here. Okay. Who's who's a cowboy you're buying stock in this season? Conversely, who are you selling stock in this season? Doesn't have to mean that you hate them. Just it means could be, it, it could be anybody I'm buying stock yes. in. Is just one person? Yes, one player you think uh, that you're buying stock in, presumably because they're prime for a good year, or a player that you're selling stock in because they might regress a little bit or what have you. Mm, 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 mm. that's a good one i'm gonna buy uh, you know i love defense defense is my thing defense mm-hmm. is my thing so you know going through everything i'm gonna say i'm gonna buy stock in osa okadazua okay Diggy, reason, i like it yeah and reason why is because you know, I could go with Michael Parsons. I could go with those guys. But what I saw, what Osa did, um, you know, and nobody was talking about Osa coming in and doing what he did. And I believe with a second year Bohanna, you know, Ridgeway in, in the in the building, Carlos Watkins, hmm. I just feel like he's going to take the next step. He was already really good as a rookie. And I just yeah. feel like 
with his wrestling background, his attitude, uh, what we saw in flashes last year. I just feel like he wore down last year as a rookie, kind of yeah. hit the rookie wall. But now he's got that year under his belt. He knows what the NFL is. And I just feel like you're going to really see some really good breakout. And I'm going to say he get like six sacks mm, minimum okay. this year. Mm. Yeah, that, that, that actually sounds doable. Yeah, because he had like four last year, right? Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that so definitely sounds six, doable. Six or seven, but he he definitely going to. I'm buying stock in him turning up this year. Okay. And who I am like I uh, selling stock on? Yep. Sell, sell, mm. sell. Mm. Ooh, wait, who am I selling stock on? Let me. I'm 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 looking through the building right now. DDP. I'm looking through the building. Um, you had a pretty outside the box pick on your first one, so yeah, I did. You know what I mean? So I, you I, was, you I was, was actually you impressed. Were, I was worried yeah, you were going to take you the same person I had. Yep, so I was yeah, like, you oh, were, okay, yeah, you, yeah. But at you the same time, taking... now I feel unoriginal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, because I got a couple people, and I just want to feel like who do I want to sell stock on more? Yeah. Um. I'm going to sell stock on, and this is a player that I want to do good, but right now I'm selling stock on Kelvin Joseph. Ooh, okay. Um, yep. I'm selling stock on him. I've, I've been saying, hey, we need to see what he's going to do. This mm -hmm. was year two. Um, you know, he was a second-round draft pick. This was a guy that's supposed to be coming in. Um, and I just feel like what, what's been going on in the offseason, we know what's, what's, what's happened to him. Yeah. Um, and I just feel like, you know, I'm, I'm selling stock in him right now. Uh, because of the off field, uh, the immaturity, the talent is there, but I'm selling stock in that. And I feel like, you know, Nation Wright, who is a kid who might not be as talented as Kevin Joseph, mm -hmm. is has the the mindset, um, the work ethic, and I think he's really gonna push uh for a spot on that team and uh, especially uh, a starting role. I think he's going to push because I feel like he's waiting to wing. So right now I'm selling, selling stock in Kelvin Joseph uh, for the immaturity, the off season. And yeah. I just don't know if he's really going to uh, take that next, that next step. That's fair enough. Uh, so my picks here, a little more straightforward for uh, the two, probably the two people would most look to, in fact. I'm buying stock in Micah Parsons. And part mm -hmm. of that is just that what he is as an athlete and what he brings to the table is just not something that you can really like health permitting. It's not really something that can be neutralized. Like that closing mm -hmm. speed is nothing that you can contend with. You can try and counteract it with some misdirection and all that. But even as a rookie, he showed a lot more like understanding of that. And that's not to say he was never out of position, but I really thought as a rookie, he was just going to rely on his, his physical gifts and just trust that and not, you know, kind of have the mental side of it down, but you really didn't see a lot of that. Like he seemed like he was really pretty consistently where he needed to be. And he made game game changing plays in the biggest moments. And even if you are throwing double teams at him, even if you are chipping him and doing all this to try and contain him, all that's mm -hmm. doing is freeing up other guys. So you can still dominate. Ask Aaron Donald. You can still dominate even if you're not racking up huge numbers personally just because right. of what you're forcing the other team to do. You're letting other guys eat, essentially. So I, I'm buying stock in Micah Parsons because I see nothing that suggests he can't have a year comparable to last year, if not even a little better. Um, and I just think that's... I think that's the best thing the Cowboys have going for them as a team. Like the single best thing they have going for them is that they lucked into him and what he's going to allow for them to do defensively moving forward. Conversely, staying on that tune of defense, I'm selling stock in Trayvon. And uh, right. I've, and, and look, it, it's not, it's not even like I'm hating on Trayvon. Right. Dude, just think about it logically. When was the last time somebody had 11 picks in a year? Exactly. That, that alone. It's not doing going that to every be, year. Exactly. It's not like year. if you bought at 11 picks, right? Like think of it as a literal stock. If you bought in based on where he did last year, do you reasonably think he's going to match or go further? No. I mean, even if you're setting aside the, the pro football focus, subjective stuff that kind of got blown out of proportion because he's a cowboy. Cause they don't talk about the other guys, the other cornerbacks that get a lot of respect 
that have similar numbers, even by those metrics, as far as like yards, they get attributed to them. Yet the narrative never addresses them. It only addresses the cowboy in the conversation, but like his stats are probably going to drop back a little bit on the picks. And if the picks drop back and he's still trying to hunt and ball hawk the way he does, he's probably still going to give up some yards. Mm -hmm. And so picks are going to be down yards are going to be comparable, maybe even up a tad. I don't know, but I, I feel like it's going to be a situation where he could still have a very good year. Still his, his next year could still be the second best cornerback year the Cowboys have had from a impact player standpoint in mm -hmm. a decade, but it's still going to be a regression. And so for that reason, I feel like he got to sell. I also think he's a guy who very much is buying into that narrative. I, I think he literally already is eyeing his next contract. And so I think he's going to be even more uh, aggressive and more focused on getting his stats in this case. Like, cause I think he knows the narrative and he knows like the best thing I have is the takeaways. And so he might gamble more. He might be even more emboldened for that. And I think that could lead to lead to some potential busted coverages and things like that. Well, we, we're going to find out. He said himself that it's easier to get sacks than interceptions. So there yep. also obviously may be a regression anyway in that aspect. But I kind of feel you, uh, especially with the Trevin Diggs thing, uh, mm -hmm. because like you said, you're not getting 11 uh, interceptions every year. We saw Richard Sherman come on the scene getting like eight, and then it just drops after that. And then people are like, well, what happened? Then make you make you no less of a, 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 a not, not a good cornerback. But that's what's going to happen. It's hard to get interceptions in the league, and you're not getting 11 or double digits every single season. It's not happening. Never right. has. You're almost – it's almost like the testament of being a great corner is that they won't throw at you, mm -hmm. that they're afraid to throw at you. Mm -hmm. The fact that he had 11 picks and he was still getting, and tested they were targeting you <laughs> tells you that like, no, they understand it's feast or famine. He might get a pick, but if you're throwing it 30 yards downfield, all right, it's a glorified punt. As long right. as he's not pick six in it the other way, right. we're fine. We're not, we can deal with that. Like that's how they kind of treated it. And mm -hmm. so if he's stepping back a little bit, just down from 11 picks, maybe it does only go to like eight, which by the way is still phenomenal as a season. Right. But maybe it does step back a little bit. And if it does, okay. Is the, are the yards still comparable? Like, is he still giving up roughly the same yards? If so, by definition, it's going to be a step back as a year. And so for that reason, I think it, it would make sense to, to sell in this case. Like if you bought in at the 11 and you know, it's dropping, then you probably want to sell. Yeah, but yeah, so that's uh, that's six shooter. We'll we'll polish that a little more, get all the fancy bells and whistles with it. But uh, I like that. I like the rapid fire nature of that. I definitely love the rapid fire nature of that. And guess what? It is about done after that six shooter, because, you know, after you get shot six times, you're probably not getting back up. So probably not. You no, know, you're probably not going to get back up. But, man, it was another great show for a positively relentless episode three. My dog, DDP, you know how we do with the Dallas Mavericks, Dallas Cowboys. Make sure you're tuning in next week because we're going to drop that next one. And we're hoping. We're I, I I'm gonna say I'm throwing in some prayers to DDP that we're talking some more playoffs and talking Western Conference finals and we feeling good. Ooh, that, don't don't let this sound good, big dog. It Western sounds Conference good. Finals. That's what we want. So we're bringing that good energy and we're gonna carry that energy over and we're not gonna be talking about nothing bad. We're gonna be talking about good things and we talking about man. Guess what? We could be going back to the finals. So yeah. Uh, and hopefully if that magic happens with the Mavericks, it can please jump over into them Cowboys because they need yeah. every bit of that right yeah. now. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So for myself, Big Game James, my dog DDP, for relentlessly positive, uh, positively relentless, I switched it up. Sorry. I'll we'll talk to you soon. All right. Peace. Peace.